I think we're set. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Jerry Burton, uh, president of Nevada Now, and we'd like to start off by introducing our board members and talk about a couple events that Nevada Now has have, have involved with uh, coming up. So uh, my board, uh, I think most of us are here. Uh, Trisha Methner is our executive vice president. Uh, Eva Love is our vice president outreach. Madalena Robertson is uh, Vice President Media. She works on our website and, and graphics. Uh, Sue Birch does a, a lot. She's the Vice President Legislative Action, Nevada Now PAC Treasurer, um, and helps me uh, with our PAC. Uh, we'll be talking about how uh, in the chat about uh, if you're running for office to, to contact us and how to do that. And Lenore Briley, Nevada Now Treasurer, and Michelle Maise is our secretary. Um, she wasn't able to make it today, but she's our newest member. And, and we're grateful for all the work she has put into helping us plan programs as well. So, and we're also joined, I don't know if both of them are here yet. I know one was having trouble getting on, but we have a, a, a student club that is associated with Nevada Now, uh, Maya Strope and Morgan Renfro. Uh, they started the Loud Girls Club at the West Career and Technical Academy in Las Vegas. And uh, they're juniors there, so we're we're excited to have them as part of Nevada now. And from what I understand, and I think I saw her name, uh, Nayeli, uh, she's the president of the Native American Student Association at the school, and um, she's joining us today. So it's wonderful to have have students and young people involved. So um, we also want to start off by uh, sending our love to Assemblywoman Shannon Bilbray Axelrod and her family today. Her father, Congressman uh, James Bilbray, passed away last night. Um, he was a respected uh, Nevada longtime public servant, obviously congressman, and a friend to many in our state. And Shannon is a, a friend, my assemblywoman, and a friend to Nevada now. And we just want to send our love and hugs to her and her wonderful mother as well. She has, I just love her mom, Mickey, or Mikey. Uh, so the uh, we also have events coming up. Um, we are involved with planning uh, the Las Vegas March for Reproductive Rights and Justice on October 2nd. Um, it's hosted by Mi Familia Voda, Nevada Now, Indivisible Owls uh, from Las Vegas, and uh, Gender Justice. Uh, I don't know if Sai is on yet, but Sai is helping us as well. And uh, there'll be other co-sponsors. It's also hosted by four young women who saw that there wasn't one planned yet and, and start, started the, the ball rolling. So I don't know. I know Laura was going to join us today, but Laura Campbell, Gabrielle, um, I think it's Hall, and Sarah Robinson and Dalen Ziegler. So we're excited to have the young women planning this with us. And we'll stay on after the program to uh, kind of do a beginning planning meeting for anybody who wants to hang on afterwards. So, um, Masks are required at the event. Um, that's something that the Women's March is, is requiring. And we are as well, um, and social distancing, and it is outdoors, so we're hoping to stay safe. We're all very aware of the pandemic. Um, we have, we'll have we have ERA and RBG masks for sale. I, For those of us, um, Zoe Nicholson, um, who might be joining us today, has been making our masks for us. Um, I have some RBG masks and some ERA Yes, masks that we'll have at the event. Um, if you want one, I have a few on hand and um, we sell those for $20 as kind of a fundraiser. $5 goes to Nevada now for our ERA events, our ERA action. So, but we'll have them at there at the March. And um, we're having a size going to host a sign making party um, at Gender Justice Nevada's office on East Karen. Um, she was going to put some information for us in the chat. Uh, 900 East Karen, and you can let us know if you want to attend. It'll be on September 29th on Wednesday at 6 p.m. And uh, we'll be making signs for the march um, and hanging out and having fun with Sai. So, and uh, we're also going to get some information on the uh, Pride events coming up in October from Sai, and we'll post the pet, put those in the chat as well. Um, we want to be involved. They're coming up in October. And then our next meeting is October 17th, uh, our next Nevada Now meeting, and um, that's going to, I'll be announcing the, the subject and the speaker soon. We've been busy planning the March in this program, so, and I think Madeline has already put some of the links in the chat, um, how to uh, join Nevada Now, we're all volunteer, uh, so we always can use help um, with some of our actions and 
Um, one of the things, two of the things we're really working on is uh, Menstrual Ex Equity Coalition, uh, working on period poverty. So if that's something you're interested in, we're putting a, a group together. And then also uh, an Equality Coalition to work on the state ERA ballot question coming up. So um, those are two areas if you're interested in either of those. And we're always working on the federal ERA. So that's something that, um, that we'll be uh, working on continually until we're in the Constitution in Nevada and in the United States, which we aren't if you're not aware. <laughs> so um, so I've, I've been wanting to plan this program for a while. Um, Sondra Cosgrove and Henderson Mayor Deborah March and I visited the Stewart Indian School in Carson City a few years back during one of the legislative sessions. And it was the first time that I heard uh, the truth about the children who attended the school and the history of um, the United States forcing Indian children in the boarding schools. And we visited the graveyard next to the school, which Stacy is going to tell us a lot about in just a bit. And, you know, I didn't know that some of these children never made it home. And, and we need to hear the, the true history of what happened in the United States. We're, we're fortunate that Deb Holland is our new U.S. Um, Interior Secretary and the first Native American to serve as a cabinet secretary. And her great-grandfather was taken to the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. And its founder is the one who coined the phrase, kill the Indian and save the man. And many of those children never made it home. So, but Deb's grandfather did. And um, because of that, you know, we're lucky that she's going, she's our U.S. Interior Secretary and, and highlighting and, and bringing up this um, important issue. And so there's, I'll put in the, the chat, there's a really great op-ed that she wrote about her family and, and how this, this has affected her maternal grandparents. Um, and so we've invited some wonderful women to tell you the history of the U.S. schools and share their family's personal experiences and to hear how we can support Native American people in Nevada and federally. So we're Grateful to be joined by Stacy Montu. She's the executive director of the Nevada Indian Commission, and she'll tell you her many other things she's involved with in our community um, when, when she comes up. Um, Mercedes Krause, she's the chair of Nevada's statewide Native American Caucus, and again, lots of other things that Mercedes is involved with in our community. And my, I also invited my friend Cheryl Wapes Mays. She's a Tacoma Now president and also a teacher at a, uh, from Washington State um, in an Indian school, and she'll be telling us about that. And all three have uh, ties to their, the history of these of the families that this has happened to, so we'll hear their personal stories. So, so that's our program, what we're starting with. Um, we're going to uh, start with a song from Juliana Brown Eyes, and I think we saw that Juliana was here. Hi, Hi, thank you, uh, Juliana. Thanks for joining us. Awesome. Thank you for having me. How I'm Juliana Brown Eyes and Machia I'm from the Oglala Lakota people. And um, yeah, Mercedes invited me. And thank you guys for having me. I'll open you guys with a prayer song. Um Chanumpa wankanta maya kuelo hayakeo pila maya yelo heyakeo we chose aniwa maya kuelo pila maya Thank you so much. That was beautiful. What a lovely way to start. And um, so next, Mercedes is going to talk to us about, you know, a lot of people start off with the land acknowledgement, but we're going to start off with the land acknowledgement 101, and then Mercedes will be passing it to Cheryl, who is in Washington State. So, Mercedes? Okay. Yeah, actually, if we can get the slide pulled up, um, I'm just briefly going to do the 101 and the land acknowledgement and then hand it over to Stacy. 
Then I have a piece um, that adds on to what's being talked about um, regarding children who were fostered out and put into, uh, adopted out into other families as part of this assimilation. Um, and then it's going to go to Cheryl. Okay, if I can get the next slide. So throughout this part and the other part that I, I put together, I kind of have a, a what not to do also. Um, it sounds like everybody you know, involved with this organization is very open and, open and wants to be aware of you know, the, best, the best etiquette. So I added some of this. If we can go to the next slide, if you just hit the arrow key, if you just hit on your keyboard, the arrow key. Let's see, you can do it manually on the board also. Oh, perfect, okay. All right, so rule number one, very important. Don't just make a land statement without also taking serious steps to create visibility and space for indigenous people in the setting that you're making this statement in. So reflect, you know, think about your space. Two things. What, what do Indigenous people say about your space? If you don't know, that's an issue. And if you do know and it's not good, in both cases, you should think about what that means and take steps. Um, you know, I know of a couple of spaces that are definitely problematic, uh, institutions that are problematic for our community that have the most lengthy, extravagant, uh, land acknowledgement statements and you know it becomes a joke at that point when uh, an organization or an institution is known in the community for not being supportive of our community so definitely i know you don't want that to happen go ahead and go to the next one so next very very important also Take the steps to know the history of the area that you live in. Make a personal connection and do some research. There are some really amazing stories. There are some very interesting stories, the beautiful stories, sad stories. Hear those stories. Find out which ones that you connect with that have something to do with stories that you know from your culture, that you make a personal connection in some way. There are many different connections you can make. Also, what are the artistic elements found in the culture of the tribal communities around you? What are their special days like and when are they? Uh, you know, uh, here in Nevada, we have pine nut days and powwows and there are a lot of really special days. When I was in Wisconsin, it was really neat to see about the ricing days and when they did the tapping days to get the maple syrup and uh, I believe the fish was a sturgeon. There, there was a very special hunting time for the fish. It was amazing because the school districts had a good relationship with the tribal communities and made their days off of school. You know how we have the days off where teachers have to do in services, et cetera. They worked together, they had a great relationship and they made it a win-win and had those days so that the students wouldn't have absences. They would be able to, you know, just have the days off and, and participate in cultural activities with their families. Also, it's really important. What are the issues that are being talked about in our community? Be an aware neighbor. Honestly, uh, I, uh, in my heart, I believe we really need to su support Southern Paiutes, Moapa Band of Paiutes. Um, things are happening in their community. Um, so those are some ways, um, you know, to get yourself ready for your land acknowledgement. Next slide, please. All right. So now that you're in this space, that you've done this work, you've put in the time, uh, it's time to look at the map. Reflect on the history of the place that you stand in. Feel your intention of making space for the people that you're talking about. Speak their names, honor their stewardship, and very important, be sure that you're recognizing, you know, don't make it sound like, oh, we're on the, we're on the traditional lands and leave it there. 
we have to acknowledge that the communities are still there and their stewardship continues into our time. And I think it's uh, really great to repeat this every morning. I'm proud that my union has started to do this at every single meeting. And I've seen other organizations doing it also. So it's not a one-time thing, not only for special occasions, something that you can do with you when you do the Pledge of Allegiance at all of your meetings. Okay, next slide. So this is the one that I put together. You can see the map. Um, there are four groups here in Nevada and 27 tribes. So my statement is, um, before beginning, we take a moment to recognize that here in Nevada, we stand on the land of the Washishu, the Numu, the Nue, and the Nuwu. We take a moment to recognize and honor their stewardship that continues into today. With this recognition, we state an intention to rightfully include their voice and respect them as the 27 sovereign tribal nations of Nevada. So also we have um, our, another speaker who stays in Washington. So uh, she's also going to do a statement uh, for the land that she is in. Next slide, please. Um, and I would like to acknowledge the land on which I am on. In Washington State, we have uh, 29 federally recognized tribes and six that are not. And three of these tribes are seeking recognition at this time. I personally reside, and you can see by the orange arrow, um, on the ancestral lands of the Stachash people of what we now call Olympia. And they were absorbed into what would become the Squaxin Island tribe. And as you can see, the majority of tribes are dotted up and down the Puget Sound area. Uh, these are the higher population areas. So therefore these reservations are very, very small. But when you get over into Eastern Washington, you can see that they are quite large uh, because they're in uh, quite isolated areas. So I would like to acknowledge that we are on the land of the Squaxin people. Um, uh -huh. Okay, and I will turn it back to, I believe, Mercedes. I believe the next slide, we go ahead and we start with Stacy. Oh, great. Yes, yeah, so Stacy Montooth, um, I, I introduced, I you know, mentioned what you do um, with the commission, but um, let us know what you, what you do, and then I know you have your information from the slide, so. Absolutely. Well, hello, hello. I'm Stacy Montooth. I'm a citizen of the Walker River Paiute Nation. I'm Northern Paiute. I'm an Aga Dukata, a trout eater. And I'm the executive director of the Nevada Indian Commission. As a Paiute woman, as a direct descendant of the boarding school era, and as a state employee appointed by Governor Sisolak, I am charged with improving the quality of life of our 27 tribal nations, bands, colonies, and 50,000 urban Indians, the vast, vast majority in Clark County. I hope my presentation today does just that. Through this public awareness of the federal boarding school area, I hope to improve the quality of life of my people. Um, in this slide, I show the matriarch of my family, my beautiful 96-year-old grandmother. Her name is Margaret Asagera, and also the United States Secretary of Interior, which um, was mentioned earlier by Ms. Burt. She is, um, her name is, is Deb Holland, and the secretary is of Pueblo La Guna people um, currently in what is called New Mexico. And again, this was mentioned earlier, she's the first Native American woman, not just to be the Interior Secretary, but to serve in the United States uh, federal presidential cabinet. So next slide, please. Now, 
Before I get rolling with my presentation, I wanted to answer something that was in the chat. There was a question about why is there all that orange? So I want to um, bring to your attention, I put an answer um, on the screen, but for those of you that maybe are on cell phones or don't have um, visual, we're wearing orange shirts a little prematurely. Thursday, September 30th, so a week from this Thursday, is National Day of Remembrance for U.S. Indian boarding schools. It's aligning with the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, and that's a Canadian-observed holiday. Um, the Canadians are quite a bit ahead of the United States when it co comes to acknowledgement and actual concrete steps taken uh, regarding the residential boarding schools, as they call them. Um, some really creative, smart, smart person came up with the idea that um, this day, sometimes called Orange Shirt Day, should um, signify um, a personal story of um, an Indigenous little girl who attended a, a residential boarding school in Canada. Um, as was the case right here at Stewart Indian School, when students came to campus, all of their belongings were taken. They were issued uniforms um, by the school. So in this case, with this young woman whose story is being reflected in Orange Shirt Day, she had a piece of clothing. It was orange, and it was given to her by her grandmother, and she absolutely treasured it. And so to honor that story and to, uh, again, put this cause in the consciousness of not just the Canadians, but in the United States, September 30th, National Day of Remembrance, we encourage everyone to wear orange. I'm actually wearing a t-shirt that I got just a few weeks ago after an event that was held here at the Stewart Indian Campus. It was all organized by this absolutely amazing 17-year-old young Paiute. He's changing the world, and um, we're going to get into his story in a little while. So let me address the slide that you're all seeing right now. So um, just really quickly, um, um, when Stewart Indian School, which it's important for you all to know, that's where I am right now. I can look out this window and see the dormitories where my grandmother her, you saw her picture. That was her home, right, right out my window. So when the school was opened initially in, in 1890, all Indian children were mandated to attend this school, some as young as four years old. And that certainly was the case with my family. The first students who came to the school, they didn't know any English, but they were expected to quickly become emerged in, in the English language. They suffered consequences, frequently corporal punishment if they spoke their native language. And even as late as 1930s, um, this amazing elder from the Reno Sparks Indian Colony shared his story with our staff, Hillman Toby, when he attended. He spoke mostly Paiute, um, and he was expected, again, to immediately emerge, and he could not speak Paiute at, at the Stewart Indian School. Next slide, please. Again, the school operated from 1890 to 1980. That seems like just yesterday for me. Um, it was attended by thousands of students, and not only from the indigenous tribes in Nevada, which Mercedes outlined, but from tribes throughout the western part of the country. In 1940, there was a special program here at Stewart that enrolled Navajo students. It was called the Navajo Special Project. This project was based on an 1868 treaty. And in that treaty, the United States agreed that they would help educate Navajo students. 1868, that legal document was signed, but nothing happened. And so it was in the 1940s that the Navajo Nation sued the federal government, won, because the United States wasn't educating their students. And Uncle Sam's response 
was to send them from the Navajo Nation, which you probably, most of you probably know, is um, in the New Mexico, Arizona area, thousands of miles from Carson City, but their students were sent up here. Again, couldn't speak their native language, hardly any of them spoke English, but they were expected to adapt as soon as possible. It's important for you to know that by 1950, half of the population here at the Stewart Indian School was Navajo. Even today, there are Navajo families all over northern Nevada, and we truly believe that it's rooted in them coming to this boarding school. Next slide, please. So it's important to understand that this was forced assimilation. And when I say forced, I mean the ugliest terms of forced. Um, this was an, an intentional, a long thought out plan by the US federal government. If you compare and contrast the, the photos that you're seeing on the screen right now, this is a young Navajo boy who attended Carlisle Institute. That's the very first boarding school in this country. So besides the physical changes, and you can see clearly his hair has been cut, he's wearing a uniform, he has no cultural jewelry, even the tone, the, the, his complexion is different. So besides the changes in his physical attributes, the removal of the students from their homelands, from their traditional lifestyles, how they were isolated, this had massive psychological impacts. And this hideous experience, it caused intergenerational trauma, and that intergenerational trauma still impacts our families today. Next slide, please. So Ms. Burton already called this out. Um, it is so hard for me to say this, but um, the motto of this federal policy was kill the Indian and save the man. And that was not just um, emotionally, physically, it was psycho uh, psychologically. This was adopted, this creed or this motto for all boarding schools. And the, the approach was not just to wipe out the unique cultures of the first people of this land, but it was ultimately about removing my ancestors from their traditional lands for use by mainstream America. Next slide, please. So it's important to know how this all began. So in 1879, um, a man who had a military background, who was part of the army, uh, Richard Pratt, he took 84 children from the Rosebud and the Pine Ridge Reservations in the Dakota Territories, and he started, if you will, the pilot program for the federal government. This took place in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and it was actually a former military camp. It was the first off-reservation Indian boarding school, and by 1902, there were 25 additional schools, including the one where I am right now, the Stewart Indian Boarding School. So I want to share this clip with you very quickly. I understand that um, me talking at you isn't always the best way to learn. So if I can have some help, um, and you could click that YouTube link, we can all watch this video. Thank you. Can you see it? My name is Andrew Windy Boy. I'm a Chippewa Cree. I did two boarding schools, one in Wapton Indian School in Wapton, North Dakota. And the other one is Flandreau Indian School in Flandreau, South Dakota. Mid-60s to early 70s, took me to the boarding school where I wasn't allowed to talk my native tongue or practice my native ways. Numerous times they 
put on this big old white, big huge white comb, put on there and said, dance. I didn't know what I meant. I didn't know English. They put it on me, make me wear it all over. Get to laugh at me. It took me away from all of that and punished me for talking that. It was my first language, I didn't know it, and yet the language, so whenever I talk, I, it came up. Cree would come out, and whenever I talk, I, I get hit. I got hit so much, I, I, I lost my tongue, I lost my native tongue. The only thing I remember was my Indian name. Which is Seyukihu. Means old man evil. That's the only Cree I knew. They beat me. Every day, they beat me. They cut off my hair, made me kneel in front of him. the door where everybody come in. Everybody make fun of me when they come by me, rub my head and laugh at me because I was talking. They caught me talking. I hope someday somebody will hear, hear me. I hope nobody has to go through this. We have to have our own language. Because what we do when we talk to our spirits, they don't understand English. They look at you, you you'll be talking the English. What are you saying? That's it, Dwayne. That's my way, Dwayne. Nobody's saying that. Three. No, you didn't know what I just said. That was a hard time in my life. I'll always remember it. For that white man, it's a terrible shame for, for him to be treating people like this. Because we are a people. We just need to be accepted. So it's hard to talk after that. And it's important that I share with you all, perhaps if you follow, you know, headlines throughout the country, 
And there was just a situation in the Midwest where two young siblings came home from school with their hair cut. The school secretary cut their hair. So I'm going to share my personal beliefs and my family beliefs with you. Certainly, I don't speak for every Native American. I don't speak for our tribal nations, but our hair is a gift from creator. Our hair is another sense, just like touch, like feel, like our sight. We only cut our hair. In my family, you only cut your hair after you suffer a loss, specifically if someone in your family dies. My grandma's 95 and I won't touch my hair for fear. It made the news that those two little ones who came home from school, public school with their hair cut, they lost an elder in their family and their, their, their traditional values, their traditional beliefs are that by cutting their hair, evil was invited and that's opened their hair being cut opened up for the opportunity for their loved ones to be taken away. So even though this amazingly brave elder that you just saw talked about this trauma that took place during the boarding school era, as Mercedes so poignantly outlined, there's still stuff happening in these spaces that really, really need attention. They need light and they need support. So um, Miss Eva, if you go to our next slide, I'll get back on track here with um, some more data. Um, and maybe while she's doing that, if everyone can make sure that they're muted, I think we have a couple people that we hear some clanking in the background and it, it, it is pretty emotional discussion. Thank you, Mercedes. So this is a, a map of, um, this is in, in 1892, and this is a map of reservations. And those, that means that this is specific land that was always indigenous, but this area was designated by the federal government as reservations, restricted area where our ancestors were allowed to live. That's the darker red colors um, that you can see quite a bit in Oklahoma and up in the Dakotas. The numbers represent the boarding schools. And again, this was only in 1892. So number 12 over here is the Stewart Indian Boarding School. Eventually, Stewart was one of 350 federally funded schools in this country. And if I haven't been clear, and if that video clip wasn't clear, my ancestors, Mercedes ancestors, our visiting professors ancestors, um, Miss Brown Eyes ancestors, my grandmother, they were forcibly abducted by government agents. We call that kidnapping, right? They were sent to these schools that were hundreds of miles away from their families, from their traditional homelands. They were beaten, they were starved. There was absolutely sexual abuse. And I can tell you that today, there's not a Paiute, Shoshone, or Washoe that doesn't have a direct connection to the Stewart Indian School. And, you know, I'm a tee shot from our state capital. Next slide, please. So if you can imagine these children, what they endured, it's what you would typically associate with boot camp. Of course, you have to remember in boot camp, that is when young adults, they volunteer 
to serve the United States military. They go into this knowing that their hair is going to be cut, that they're going to have to wear uniforms, that they're going to have to learn how to march, that physical fitness is a must, and that, you know, corporal punishment is frequent. But our ancestors didn't even speak English. Next slide, please. So interestingly, COVID-19 is not the first pandemic for Native Americans. In fact, during the boarding school era, illnesses like the Spanish flu, yeah, tuberculosis, the whooping cough, measles, smallpox, all of those were rampant. And they were especially bad because of the overcrowding, the, you know, the small confines of all these institutions. Certainly healthcare was not a priority and our, our relatives were always hungry and often unhealthy. Next slide, please. So, so there was a very strict regimen of academic study in the morning. This was reading, writing, and arithmetic. It was all based on what we think of as, as you know, public schools today, um, it, even as far back as, you know, the, the, the Greeks, right? You have an instructor and you learn, um, you know, these fundamentals. However, at the boarding schools, they also incorporated vocational training. Um, religious instruction was a big part of the boarding schools. So the whole day was punctuated by bells and whistles. And again, the students had to march everywhere. Um, the revelry was how the students were woke in the morning. Um, the idea to instill some kind of a vocation, some kind of a trade, that was with the thinking that after their time at boarding school, they would become a productive member of, of mainstream society. So the, this picture is in a shop. The, the boys, the male students, they were taught about ranching and blacksmithing, mechanics, woodworking, painting, um, carpentry. In fact, 69 of the buildings that are on this campus still today were actually built by the male students here at this campus. Next slide. And not surprisingly, gender roles were very emphasized. So again, all the students would attend academic training in the morning. They were divided by gender. Um, and then their vocational training or their trades, it was based on what we would consider stereotypical gender roles. The girls learned how to bake, to cook, to sew, to do laundry, um, some nursing, those kind of things. Vocational training was the school's focus until the late 60s, and it slowly started to shift towards academics. Next slide, please. If you followed the headlines, and um, maybe you heard me mention earlier, um, there was religious influences in all the boarding schools. The Stewart um, boarding school, it was absolutely operated by the federal government. However, there was a heavy religious influence. Even today, if you visit campus, when you arrive, the entrance, the main entrance, it's flanked by a Catholic church on one side and a Baptist church on the other side. In Canada, um, and a, much, much more in the Midwest of the United States, organized religion really was prominent in the day-to-day -day operations of, of the boarding schools. In this picture, you can see there was an actual pool built, and um, it was used for baptisms. And I probably don't have to tell you, this kind of religious indoctrination was done without any kind of parental consent. Can you imagine what would happen in public schools today if children were baptized or, you know, go through confession? Next slide. You know, one of the other really interesting aspects of the boarding schools, and it continues today, is 
the abundance of Native Americans who joined the military. So I've heard alumni and tribal leaders say that the boarding schools offered like an easy way to recruit for the military. They just come to the campuses and it was kind of one-stop shopping, right? There was no need to go house to house and get parents' permissions. They would just, you know, enlist these young men and women. So interestingly, throughout the history of the United States, Native Americans have always served in higher numbers per capita we make up about 1% of America now. We serve in higher numbers of any other subpopulation in the country. Even today, 2021, there are more female Native American soldiers who have volunteered for the United States uh, military than any other ethnicity. I haven't been able to ever find any scientific data why that happens. I can tell you in my own family, seven uncles, both of my dad served. I've got five nephews, one niece that all served. I heard one of the most respected Northern Nevada tribal leaders one time say that he believes, and he's a, a Marine, that Native American people volunteer for the service because we truly, truly know that this is really our land. It's our land and we're gonna fight for it no matter what government is in power. We're gonna, we're gonna defend Mother Earth. Next slide. So yet another example of how resilient the strength of my ancestors and how they adapt. So, Despite these bleak circumstances, students found a way to create community outside of these regiments and these harsh punishments that they endured. This was done through music, through sports, and through art. Again, Native Americans, they adapted to their surroundings and they built community. Stewart was very well known for how good their basketball team was. They played in the state championships three times in the 30s. They won the state championship in 1966. They had boxers who were Olympic trial uh, candidates. They tried out for the Olympics. Um, even today, you can still see in the old gym, um, there is a mural that um, labeled the, the space Moccasin Square Garden. It was the site of a lot of training. And again, it was, it was the, the, the place where these young men um, got their interest in boxing and, and you know, pursued it to Olympic heights. Um, music and art were extremely valued. Um, the school was, the students were extremely fortunate that um, there was a, a music teacher, just a fantastic educator who taught the students not just to read and to sing and to write music, but to play every kind of instrument. In fact, in 1904, students from the Stewart Indian School were invited to to perform during the Louisiana Purchase Exhibit, which happened in St. Louis. So even today, we have a Great Basin Native American Artists Consortium, uh, Consortium and it includes fine professional artists. And it all dates back to what was called the Wapashan Gallery that was opened here on campus in the 40s. Next slide, please. So here's where things take a bit of a turn. In the 1920s, uh, the U.S. Secretary of Interior, again, not a Native woman, not a Native, but the Secretary in the 1920s commissioned um, uh, the Brookings Institute, which I'm sure you all are familiar with. The staff from the Brookings Institute investigated the impacts of not just federal Indian policy, but boarding schools. And they compiled this just groundbreaking study. It was called the Miriam Report. And this publication finally started to poke the consciousness of the American people when the general public learned about the dismal state of Indian country, federal policies 
towards all the first peoples of this land finally started to shift. Just like nowadays, all the wheels of government turn slowly, but this was really the identifying point. And I'm proud to tell this group especially that the school got a female superintendent. Her name um, was Alita Bowler, and she radically changed how the students were treated. Next slide, please. So even though the policy was rewritten and it was included in the New Deal, um, and that was, of course, under FDR, the changes really came slowly. It wasn't until the 1960s that students actually wanted to attend Stewart. Next slide, please. It was in the last two decades of the schools operating that the curriculum finally changed and it wasn't focused on vocations and trades. It became about academics and the environment was actually more welcoming to Native American culture. To this day, some of our alumni during this era, they have fond memories. They have a lot of pride in attending Stewart. Next slide, please. It's a really, really complex history, which is absolutely in keeping with everything about Indian country. After the United States Civil Rights Movement and after the founding of um, AIM, the American Indian Movement, civil liberties and social justice, they were actually considered. And um, that really changed, again, the way that the Stewart Indian School was operated. You can see in the last two pictures, no more uniforms. And um, at this point, it was uh, in 1970, it was just a, a four-year high school. Next slide, please. So even though um, equity for civil liberties and social justice for Indian people, it's still not been achieved. But again, as I outlined, my job is to improve the quality of life by sharing accurate firsthand accounts of our boarding school alumni, the Numa, the Nui, the Washishishi people, we're continuing to make progress and we are empowered by telling our own story. Next slide, please. In fact, in uh, 2015, the Nevada governor at that time, Brian Sandoval, and the legislature, they appropriated state funding and created the Stewart Indian School Cultural Center and Museum. Ms. Um, Burton mentioned that earlier. What it does is interpret the 90-year history of this school. The Culture Center opened in January of 2020, just a couple months before the pandemic was officially declared. It's dedicated to the memories of the first Stewart students, those from the Great Basin tribes, and all of the students and the families that have been impacted by an experience at, at this campus. The main um, exhibit in the gallery, it outlines the milestones in the 90-year history that um, indicate all the changes that the campus went through. It tells stories of the students who attended, and it's in their own words. We have it in writing. We have it in pictures. We have audio recordings. So it's, it's multimedia. It's absolutely vital. It's not only helpful for healing, for addressing that intergenerational trauma, but it's so important that we preserve. We need to have worldwide recognition of our truth. And I'm so grateful for you all listening today. You're giving me that opportunity. Next slide. So I am including the standard, here's how you can help. Um, some pretty easy things. Maybe you can allocate two minutes today. Like the Nevada Indian Commission and the Stewart Indian School Cultural Center um, Facebook pages. Visit frequently um, our website, um, Nevada Indian Commission and the StewartIndianSchool.com pages. There's links here. 
Of course, you can make tax deductible donations to either the Nevada Indian Commission or the Stewart Indian School. We're one in the same, the exact same mission. Um, and your contributions can go for everything from helping us, again, record elders' stories of what they experienced here to bringing in performers and artists. Um, you can advertise in our powwows. Um, Mercedes mentioned earlier, um, the Pine Up Festival is taking place today, actually, in Shures, Nevada. And as I began um, my part of the presentation, celebrate the National Day of Remembrance with us, September 30th. It's a Thursday. Wear an orange shirt. Or if you are in a situation where you're able, buy a shirt um, from the U.S. Uh, Indian Boarding School's Healing Coalition. Um, NABS is the acronym for them. So, um, I'm happy to answer questions um, at the end, and I will try hard to monitor the chat. Thank you all for your attention. So over to Mercedes. All right, if you could turn to the first slide, I, I have a little story. I, I wrote it down because I didn't want to miss any of the details. When I was remembering it, I was like, feeling all of the details, and so I wrote them down so I can remember. So um, first, uh, I'm a little shy. I've been getting brave. I, of course, also had a language loss in my family, um, but I do know a little bit of my introduction in Lakota. I'm a little shy because I have someone from my community here, but <laughs> I'll just go ahead and do it. Chante um, washte nape chiosafi. Mercedes Kraus, Oglala Lakota Hemacha, Ehoka Okolokichi Hemacha. I'm Mercedes Kraus, I'm Oglala Lakota, um, and I'm Badger Society. Okay. So I'm going to start with the story. It was a beautiful November at the Southern Paiute Veterans Memorial. My girls got ready early, and yay, we found ourselves not rushing and racing to get to grand entry. Um, very nice morning. We drove. Uh, it's about a 30-minute drive or so. We blasted all of our favorite songs and sang together the whole way there. Beautiful morning. So the intertribal started, and, and I, I don't dance, so I get really excited when the intertribal comes on because that means I can get in there and dance a little bit. So I'm dancing in the soft, sunny November weather. Beautiful day. And I looked across the arena and I saw my wonderful friend. Um, she's the one who taught my girls how to dance. I saw her and her daughter there. My loves, my girls were there dancing near me. And I, I just felt pure joy. And then at that same time, a wave of consciousness uh, poured over me. And... Uh, I had a moment where I just kept thinking that we were not supposed to be there and that this moment was not supposed to be happening. Her mom had been in boarding schools and mine had been kidnapped by the system. Um, according to the plan, we should have been assimilated and we should not have been there doing this at all. But we were, so that, that trick, it hadn't worked on us. It was a good feeling, but it was still underscored by grief and anger because our family should not have had to go through what they went through, should not have. So in my life, uh, you know, for a long time, I always wondered why and how I could feel two ways at the same time. So now thinking about it, it makes perfect, perfect sense that even in times of joy, you know, there's sadness there. And my experience in this sense are not unique because my family's experience is not unique. So my mom, um, she was left in an orphanage for two years before being adopted. We know that zero to three is the most important time in a child's life. And instead of contacting her grandmother or other moms, uh, because in our culture, your aunts are also your moms, they left her in an orphanage for two years rather than putting her with family. Um, she did not know her race when she was growing up. 
it was hinted at that she was native, but um, because it was something that they felt shameful, there was shame attached to, you know, uh, they, they tried to hide it. And she did not escape the mental abuse, the physical abuse, or from extended family, uh, very sadly, the sexual abuse that countless other Native children have experienced when separated. So you can see, um, I added some information there on this slide. And, um, you know, 25 to 35 percent of all Native children were separated from their homes and either in foster care or adoptive care or back and forth between foster and adoptive care. One number that I heard was by 1978, it was one third of all of our children. So imagine we have one third of all of our children being assimilated through these forced adoptions. And we have the other group, you know, in, in the boarding schools being harmed and assimilated uh, in religious schools. Also, it's very important to note that 25% uh, of the time uh, that Native children were removed, only 5% of the similar cases, uh, non-Native children were removed. And why? I, I think it was hinted at, uh, or I think it was pretty clear, she said it before, uh, you know, being moved off into these reservations so that our land could be taken, you know, despite treaty, uh, treaty arrangements and agreements, uh, you know, why did this happen? Why did this happen to our children? And, and in some areas, it, in, it's still happening. You can hear stories. I know uh, I've heard from the Lakota uh, Law Project that fostering, you know, they come and they take kids out of homes and put them into non-Native homes, even if there are Native homes. And there, in this case, there's a monetary reason behind it. But in this first case is the, the why, the horrific why was part of genocide. So if you could please move to the next slide. So it did not work and it, it did not work. You can see the, the thriving community. Um, Stacy, I, I was hoping she would say it. I'm going to throw it in there. There is a really amazing story. She was talking about a young man. And this young man, I think he made the shirt that, that she made, if I'm not mistaken. And this young man is a track athlete. And um, Billy Mills actually asked if he could meet him because he had heard of him. And this young man retraced the steps that his eight-year-old grandfather took when running away from the Stewart Indian School. There are so many amazing youth doing amazing things. You know, we have Juliana here uh, on here. Um, I met one of her friends who's also Oblala, and she went with one of my nieces. The three of them uh, went to some STEM trainings when they were growing up. And now they're doing amazing things, you know, out there, amazing things with their lives. And this is my family. And, and this is my beautiful matriarch. I love her so much. And, you know, understanding some of the things that she went through now, I, I didn't understand before. It, it's been pretty emotional for me this this actually past week, um, I, I had really bad dreams for, for a little while. And now I didn't, I thought I wasn't going to cry today, but you know, I, I had tears for the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, this is, it's really hard to think of the people that you love going through this, but we are still here. I know my family, uh, my prayer was that I would get to see a picture of my grandmother so I would know what she looked like. Because one of the things that my mother always would say, she would just stare at us because her whole life she grew up around people who didn't look like her. And so she would stare at us because she had people that look like her. And when we finally went to, to back home, and she saw her sisters and her cousin sisters, you know, um, to see family that look like her. This was, I'm so glad that she got to have this experience. But these are my, my Lakota women. These are my strong Lakota daughters. 
they study the sciences, they know way more language and song. And my daughter made those dresses that you see in that picture. She does leather work. Um, so I'm very proud of them. My point I want to make from that is that we are still here all across this country, all across North America. We are still here. So one of uh, if you can turn to the next slide, one of the uh, very important ways that we have gotten stronger is through protections. It was talked about um, there was a study done and uh, I forget all the details. I should have looked it up, but uh, you might have heard the, the canary in the coal mine. Uh, you know, the idea was that when we look at what is happening to indigenous people, this is like the canary in the coal mine for what's happening across the country. And when they saw, well, I mean, imagine if it, there's not really love. We know that there's not really love for the community. But when they saw the things were so inhumane that they took action, um, one of the actions was an act of Congress and protections called um, the Indian Child Welfare Act. And they're very important. I think Mercedes froze. Hopefully she'll be back. I just let her know so maybe she can log back on. Stacy, do you want to take over for a minute? Would it be okay if I turned it over to Ms. Cheryl? I think that's a good idea. And then, yeah, then Mercedes can finish. Thank you. Sure. Cheryl, do you want to? Do you want me to um, stop sharing? Uh, well, uh, I don't know how long she's going to. Let her know in case she can pop back on. But um, do you want, can, um, maybe I we could can start out by just introducing myself and telling yep. a little bit about myself. Um, we don't need to go forward to my slides or anything like that. Um, my name is Cheryl Wapesha Mays. Um, my last name, Wapesha, is a name that I chose uh, to legally change my name to when I married my uh current husband, um, and then hyphenated with his name, uh, Wapesha in uh, the Nakoda, Dakota and Lakota language uh, means headdress, and that is my family's name um, at Fort Peck Reservation. So um, I, I wanted to take on my family name, but I was very, very involved in um, stabilizing indigenous languages conferences and I taught an endangered language and so I wanted to choose a language name for my last name. Um, I am enrolled as Cinnaboyne Sioux at Fort Peck Reservation in northeastern Montana. I also have ancestry with the Métis people, Manitoba, Chippewa, and Cree. Um, I, I am an urban Indian. I was born and raised here in Western Washington. I have lived here my whole life uh, and my children and my grandchildren and my great grandson also have been born here in Western Washington. My mother came to uh, not my, excuse me, my grandmother, Henrietta Headdress. Uh, she came out to Washington, to the Puget Sound area to get work because there was no work back at Fort Peck for a single mother. And so she left her children, my mother, my auntie, and my uncle, 
uh, with her parents, my great grandparents, and she came out here and worked in the shipyards uh, in Tacoma and Bremerton during World War II. And she wound up staying and uh, brought my mother and my auntie and my uncle out when she could afford to. And they all stayed too, although they always maintain close relationships with their families um, back uh, on the reservation and visited quite often. So uh, as an urban Indian, um, I, I chose to go into education, knowing that I wanted to go into Indian education when I went to college, uh, which was when my own children were old enough to go to school. And I was fortunate enough to get a job at Chief Lesh High Schools. Um, well, now I'm kind of, I, I'd kind of like to have the slide for this one because this is kind of where I started. Uh, if you could maybe scroll down and then I can stop any time when Mercedes gets back on and then she can finish. So I'm, I'm okay with that. So let's go. Yeah. Tell me where you want me to. Okay, so just go one. Uh, I think it's actually 37. Yeah, it's slide 37. Okay, and then the next one. And I, this is a picture of the Missouri River and our people were uh, canoe paddlers. And so uh, we're right on the edge. And this is where we're located in Northeast Montana and a picture of our flag, Fort Peck tribes. Um, my Sioux side is Sisseton Wapaton, uh, and I'm also very proud of that side of my family. So this is my school. I've, I took an 18 month uh, retirement <laughs> and then I went back just in time for COVID to hit, but uh, we're located in the Puyallup Valley near Mount Rainier and you can see her in the background and uh, when the sky is blue, we say the mountain is out. We don't really say the sky is blue or there's no clouds. It's the mountain is out. And, and she is just magnificent. And there's wonderful stories uh, within the different uh, Puget Sound tribes uh, that, um, that talk about her. And there's a saying in Tulshootseed, uh, Buck Stola Faulty Squatach. All rivers come from that mountain. And so uh, this is where I teach. It's where I spent the last 35 years, except for the 18 months that I thought I wanted to retire. And um, so next slide, please. Um, I teach 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Um, I love middle school. I've taught everything from 3rd grade up through uh, community college, uh, but I am really partial to middle schoolers. And uh, this year I am teaching 6th grade Indigenous world history, and we explore cultures around the world and examine the effects of colonization. I want to teach them young. Uh, seventh grade, Washington State Indian Sovereignty. We have to have Washington State history to graduate, but about 12 or 13 years ago, I decided that it needed to be taught from the uh, Native perspective, and so I added Indian Sovereignty onto the course, and um, we study uh, we do learn how Washington became a state and territories and those types of things that kids are going to learn in public school because they do need to know that. But the real focus is the impact of white settlements, settlement on the indigenous people of what would become Washington state. And then the eighth grade is U.S. native sovereignty and uh, also the implications of colonization on um, people of the United States. This is my great grandmother, Sarah Mitchell Headdress. Um, she was sent to Chamawa boarding school when she was five or six years old and stayed there for about 10 years. And uh, Chamawa opened in 1880. I believe it was the second boarding school to open right after um, Carlisle in Pennsylvania. 
And uh, it actually started as an elementary school, but grades were added and it became a fully accredited high school in 1927. And uh, today it serves ninth through 12th grades. And I've had some of my middle school students over the last several years who, who left Leshai and wanted to go to Chamawa because it has become a wonderful place to be. Um, my my great-grandmother, uh, she didn't lose her tongue. She was very lucky, but she was also very sneaky because a lot of the Sioux kids would gather together and hide and talk to each other so that they could maintain their languages. And um, she, she became a, uh, a Mormon later in life uh, and, and was very dedicated to the Mormon church and made sure that her children and grandchildren were raised Mormon. Uh, and so my mother was Mormon, but, but I was not. Um, and all of my cousins back on the reservation are, are still Mormon. Um, she, she, is, she was a quilt maker. And she has one of her quilts hanging in the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. And uh, another one in another museum uh, outside of D.C., but I can't remember where that is. And uh, next time I go back to D.C., I, def I definitely want to uh, go view it. Um, I have one of her quilts that she made. Uh, and she made my daughter, who was named Sarah, after her uh, a baby quilt, a uh, star quilt, when she was born. Uh, she passed away when uh, my daughter was about 10 years old. And I, I always regretted that I, I didn't get to know her well, but I, I did get to visit with her and, and see her on occasion. Uh, she was a great horsewoman. <laughs> and she helped my great grandfather break horses, which is what he did for a living with the white ranchers. Uh, next slide, please. And this is my great grandfather, Henry Headdress. Uh, he he was also known as Hank, and he he was he was a very wealthy man, according to Assiniboine standards. He never had two dimes to rub together, but he had many horses. And therefore, he, he was very wealthy. And he was one of the greatest Indian cowboys of all time. He, he was a rodeo rider. He broke horses for the um, ranchers uh, that... Uh, were white ranchers that were able to get land on, on Fort Peck. Um, and uh, he was uh, sent, he, he was lucky enough to not be sent away to boarding school, but he was sent to the Fort Peck Indian Agency School, uh, which is, I believe, near Fort Kip, where he was born, but, but he lived in Wolf Point, his family did. And uh, that school was established in 1881. Um, his father, Al Hedress, uh, was threatened with prison time if he did not let my, gra my great grandfather go to boarding school. Um, he, Al Hedress and Henry Hedress were both great traditionalists. They, they practiced, um, our old ways and our old religions. And even though he and great grandma Sarah, you know, were of two different uh, religious beliefs, they had a very long and very loving marriage for many, many years. Um, and he also never lost his tongue. He always had his language. But somewhere along the line, when my grandmother and my uncle Dale and um, my Auntie Doris um, came along, they wouldn't let them learn Nakoda. They only spoke Indian in the household when they wanted to talk about something that they didn't want the kids to know what they were talking about. 
And that has always broken my heart because as a traditionalist, I really believe that maybe Henry didn't want that to happen, but, but it did. But uh, grandma was much more um, assimilated and um, probably allowed that to happen. But I understand, I understand thoroughly why she would, or both of them would have that happen, is they probably did not want them to go through what great grandma Sarah went through at Chamawa. And she understood that if, if her and her friends had not snuck away to practice speaking Nakoda, Lakota, Dakota, that, that they would lose their tongues. And my grandma was sent to Chamawa. Uh, and my Uncle Dale and my Auntie Doris when they were old enough to go. And uh, they went there speaking English. So they probably had it a little bit easier. And this was in the, um, oh my gosh, uh, Grandma was born in 1914. So this would have been in the uh, 20s. Um, they, they raised my mother uh, when my grandma was working all of the time and when my mother wasn't able to go out there. My mother was raised in two worlds, in Tacoma and back in Wolf Point. And it, it was really good for her because she, she really was able to walk in two worlds. Uh, the only thing is that she never had her language, which she always regretted. But... Um, she was lucky enough to have that relationship with her grandparents and to be raised in a more traditional way. So uh, next slide. So to understand how the government used boarding schools as a tool to control Indians, we need to look at treaties and reservations as well as the impact of boarding schools. And the main goal of the treaties was to secure land for white settlement and said treaties provided for land set aside for Indians to live on. Uh, and the main goal of Indian reservations were to bring Native Americans under US government control, to minimize the conflict between Indians and settlers, and to encourage Native Americans to take on the ways of the white man. It, it was basically uh, the goal to assimilate the American Indian Aboriginal. And at this time, I'd like to share with you that when the Bureau of Indian Affairs was established under the, uh, the uh, da, 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 what is that? Uh, the BIA was, a, okay, so first you have the president and then you have the Department of War and then you have another, and I don't know why I forgot that. I teach this all the time, uh, but under that, oh, the Department of the Interior, duh. So, so you have the president, you have the Department of War, you have the Department of the Interior, and then you have the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And when the Bureau of Indian Affairs was established, its mission statement was to assimilate and or annihilate the American Indian Aboriginal. Mm. And uh, I, I teach that to my students and it was really kind of funny one time and this was many years ago. I'm kind of on a rip telling the kids, you know, all of this stuff. And who walks in but people from the BIA, the superintendent was giving them a tour and, and they stand there and they listen for a little bit. And then as my superintendent walks out, he looks at me and goes, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. He always had my back though. So, <laughs> okay, next slide, please. Um, so treaties also included articles that provided for a teacher to live on the reservation, but this was in conflict with the goal of assimilation as children lived with their parents and or extended family. So off-reservation boarding schools became the best hope of speeding up the assimilation process of Indian children by removing them from their homes. And they were removed as early as toddlers and sometimes infants. Mm -hmm. uh, separating them from their families disrupted children's relationships with their parents and other members of their family and tribe. 
And so there, there was a definite disconnect with many of these children, especially, especially if they did not have the means to go home, you know, for vacations in summertime, and some of them did not. Next slide, please. And so uh, a little bit of an idea about um, how land was divvied up. I've got a couple of examples. My treaty is the Fort Laramie Treaty. The original treaty was 1851 and uh, it wasn't working out so well for the government. So they decided to establish a new treaty in 1868 because they needed to reduce the size of the Great Sioux Nation. And you can see um, on, let's see, um, I'm looking on the left hand side is the original land designated in 1851, uh, the Great Sioux Nation. And on the right side, they kind of divvied it up and created Pine Ridge, Rosebud, Cheyenne River, Standing Rock, uh, the Crow, the Northern Cheyenne, and other reservations. Uh, within or just outside the boundaries of the Great Sioux Nation and um, the lands that are not in yellow uh, in other colors, those were opened up to white settlement. And um, the unceded territory is basically territory that we never signed away. And, and this is land that we're still trying to get back to this day. Um, and uh, the Great Sioux Nation uh, covered uh, lands in North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Nebraska, Wyoming, and as far as Colorado. And those yellow dots you see here are what we have now. So next slide, please. And here where I live, the Medicine Creek Treaty of 1840-1854 also designated lands for uh, the South Puget Sound tribes of what is now uh, Washington State. Um, you can see where, if you can read it, uh, there were a lot of treaties signed. Um, Governor Stevens, territorial Governor Stevens, went around Washington State in the span of uh, maybe a year, year and a half, starting in December of 1854. And the first treaty that was signed was the Medicine Creek Treaty, which was signed with the people who would become the Puyallup, the Nisqually, and the Squaxin Island peoples, and then proceeded to go around uh, Washington Territory and signed treaties with all of the other places. And what you see on the left side are all traditional uh, territories of these uh, many, many different peoples who lived um, in these areas. And uh, today uh, we have uh, 29 federally recognized tribes and on the uh, that was the left side, good gosh. Okay, so on the right side, what you see is um, the 29 federally recognized tribes that we have here in Washington. And because the um, Puget Sound region is so heavily populated from Canada all the way down to uh, Portland, um, the reservations are very, very small. At, at one point, um, the Treaty of Medicine Creek covered a great, huge area uh, in the lands that were set aside for the Indians, and it was whittled down to a, a small reservation uh, in, at Nisqually, which is just a maybe 10 miles from me, and then 30 miles north of me is the Puyallup Tribal Reservation, and it's split into three separate areas in and around Tacoma. And then the Squaxin Island people were from seven inlets of uh, South Puget Sound, and each of those inlets were, um, were uh, separate bands of people and they were combined together to become the Squaxin Island. And um, where I live is, is the Stachash people. 
So Olympia was at one time the, uh, the home of the Stachash people who have now been absorbed into uh, one, one tribe of people by the government. And I think there might be one more slide. I'm not sure, I can't remember. <laughs> oh, so this, this is going to kind of wrap it up. Uh, Dr. Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart defines historical trauma as the cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over one's lifetime and from generation to generation following loss of lives, land, and vital aspects of culture. And we were driven from our lands, forbidden to speak our languages or express our cultures, and boarding schools were a driving force in extinguishing our right to be who we are as a people. And children were taken from their families and placed in faraway boarding schools and faced abuse of every kind. We were taught the white man's ways to speak only English and to stifle our native culture. And worst of all, we were taught to be ashamed of being native. Um, I had also planned on showing the video about Andrew Windy Boy, but I would like to just go back and reference that as you watched that video, th that is what historical trauma looks like. And, and it becomes generational and it has happened to, to so many of our people and continues to happen. There are people in my age group who were also victims of boarding schools. And because I'm an urban Indian, I didn't have to go to a boarding school. Um, but I have many friends who did go to boarding schools and they carry those scars with them every single day. And it has passed on to their children and their grandchildren. And the, the children I work with every day are also victims because these generational and historical traumas are passed on to them. And so um, I would like to say thank you. Um, Thanks, Carol. Did, that Mercedes got back on. Are you oh, still there, Mercedes? Yeah, I'm here. Um, I would like it. I don't know. Did someone read my slides or should I? Okay. <laughs> you pick up where you left off. I thought if you could finish up and then Cheryl was going to, we were going to do the, the talking stick at the very end, Cheryl. So we'll go back to you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. If you could just go back to that slide for a moment. Um, the, the one where I froze, I guess. <laughs> Um, but it, it goes along with what she's saying right now about, you know, uh, loss of culture and what a terrible impact it can have. And one of the protections that went into place when uh, I think I think it was known, but when it started to become public knowledge of how horribly like Horrible is not even the word to describe, you know, what was happening. Um, the Indian Child Welf Welfare Act was put into place. But if you could turn to the next slide, um, it is actually an issue right now. So um, I was on, I was driving, and of course NPR is in the background, and I hear someone talking about ICWA. And, you know, we, we've seen it quite a few times uh, over the years, different cases, and usually they, they show the, the child and make it seem like, oh, the child is happy where they're at. How can you rip them away? They, they've only known this family. Well, when you think about the trauma of cultural loss and that, no, those people do not know what this child needs. Their family, their, their relatives, and their tribe knows what this child needs. Um, we've seen those cases, but the way that, uh, and I have a link in there and you can look it up. It was on, uh, this land, uh, on New York public radio. And there was a woman who also has a, a podcast, uh, or her podcast is this land. It was on, um, NPR and she was saying what's happening now 
the reason that these uh, that we see some lawsuits about ICWA is not about children. It's actually not about children. It is about undermining tribal sovereignty. So uh, I have some more slides that are going to explain. Native American people are not a fourth racial group. We are not a racial group. We are a political group. We are a sovereign group of people, a, a political group with treaties with the United States government. So because of this, uh, there are different things in place, like our, our, our health care system, things like the uh, in Indian health care. So these cases that are being brought have to do with, uh, you know, conservative people. They are looking to undermine tribal sovereignty in this case, in this emotional case where they can get some leverage because they haven't had leverage in undermining sovereignty when it comes to cases they've had, uh, you know, fighting against tribal industry such as casinos. So these lawsuits that you see are, some of them are by the same lawyers that have done these lawsuits uh, uh, against tribal casinos. So it, it is not a humanitarian thing. It's a conservative attack on tribal sovereignty. So if you can go to the next slide and keep that in mind when you hear people talking about ICWA. ICWA is based on citizenships. We are dual citizens. I am a dual citizen of the Oglala Lakota Nation. I'm not just a, 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 an Indian person. I'm a citizen of my nation, and there are diplomatic relations that go with that. Again, I want it to be stated there are 573 sovereign tribal nations. We talked about the ones in Washington and Nevada today, but all over the United States, these sovereign tribal nations exist. And ICWA does not talk about a race of people. It talks about citizens. And so protecting tribal sovereignty is paramount. Um, and, uh, you know, we've seen the attacks on, on our liberties and attacks on sovereignty. Uh, we're going to be seeing more of them. It's a calculated uh, action. So, again, the U.S. Constitution affirms the political status of our people. Go ahead and um, go to the next slide. These protections are vital. Uh, we've talked, we've heard about the, the trauma, the generational trauma. Well, that generational trauma comes from culture loss, language loss, being separated from family. Uh, there is, uh, you know, it's very long-term, it's very important to be raised within our culture. So opposing ICWA deprives Native children of advocacy and support from their tribal nations. Okay, I think that uh, that covers everything. Um, again, tribal sovereignty, uh, very important. Thank you so much. It's a lot of information. Um, we're going to do something kind of special with Cheryl. She'll explain in a second um, to and then we can do some questions if people want to hang on and, and we want to make sure there's time for that as well. Um, and we thank you for taking the time to, to come and talk to us. And um, we'll put out an email with a lot of the links we've talked about. Um, if there's some things we missed, I'll, I'll get them from you. And um, that way people can have it an email with all the links we've talked about and take action and, and learn. Um, and, I think we were going to include some books and movies that people can watch and we'll put that out so that we can learn more. I've been, ever since I heard about it, I've been trying to get my hands on everything I can and read books and, and, and learn. So we promise we'll do that. Um, Cheryl, do you want to explain what we're doing with the, the talking stick? Okay. Well, this, this staff was created, my, my mother was an alcohol counselor for the Puyallup tribe for 24 years and um, she would have talking circles with, with her clients, uh, the, the ones who were um, in-house and, and also the ones who, who would come and go and, and come in every day. Um, and so everything that is on here was put on here by 
her clients who she would have talking circles with. And um, when she passed away in 2010, and there are six daughters, uh, we just kind of went through everything uh, and decided, you know, who was going to get what. And believe it or not, but we six sisters, we get along beautifully, and we were all in 100% agreement. Uh, but uh, apparently, because I teach uh, youth, and at that time I was teaching high school, uh, they had gotten together and determined that I should have the staff in my classroom. And so I keep it in my classroom. And when we have talking circles with my advisory kids, uh, we do pass the staff around. Now, uh, what would be more powerful than to be able to pass this staff around to each of you? But it's going to have to be done in a virtual sense because of where we are. And so I would like to virtually pass this staff to Eva. And then Eva, if, if you would... Um, uh have different people i i believe we wanted people to put uh a takeaway what would you what would you take away what did you take away from this what did you learn from this has this changed you in any way and that's kind of how i do my classes after we have a lesson or or something very emotional happens within our community and we need to talk about it. So if you would virtually pass this staff to people who would like to share, um, I would very much. Could, they can either put it in the chat or, or raise their hand or, you know, whatever we want to do to, to say that they want to say something. Yeah. Okay. So I would like to start by saying that um, this is really hurts my heart so much to think about all these children. And one of the things that was said the other day in our pre-meeting was about how these schools had, had um, cemeteries. And to think that a school would have a cemetery for the children that died was horrific to me. And of course we know that there's, school in Canada, uh, they found over 200 children buried in a mass grave. And that just, it, it just breaks my heart. And I'm, I'm so sad for it. So I, I put my hand up, but I'll go next. Okay. Um, that, is, that is one thing that we, we didn't talk a lot about today, but that's what struck me um, was the the children, um, they talked about the diseases and the abuse and, and, you know, knowing that many of these children didn't get to go home. And luckily, the people there are wonderful women that are speaking today, their, their ancestors did get to go home and they, they are still here, as Mercedes said, that just gives me chills because these what wonderful, uh, one of the things we didn't want to do was, uh, you know, be a uh, it's sad, but we we wanted to see how, sorry, look how proud we are of these wonderful women and what they've achieved and, and what they're passing forward. So that's it's that's what I got from it. So thank you. Um, looks like you could pass it, Eva. You're the pass pastor. To Bernice. Hello, my name is Yetko. It means calm water. I'm from Canada, and we sent 150,000 children to school over a 100-year period. 75,000 of them returned. And what's happening right now is um, my band, Cook's um, Kamloops Indian Band, we found the bodies of 215 children, and this started um, a snowball effect. Like you said, there's um, graveyards by each school. And in, in our schools today, we don't have a graveyard, graveyard by them. And my whole entire family went. They were forced by the federal government. They wanted the land. And 
Phyllis, I got to meet her. She started the Orange Shirt Day up in Canada. In 1980, five people in their 40s committed suicide. And the coroner said, why is this happening? And this happened in Lytton, BC, where St. George's Residential School was built. And he said, what's happening? That's his job, to find out why these people are killing themselves. And with these five men, they all went to the residential school. And that started the snowball effect. From that, we had the, the federal government apolo apologize for sending the, our, our people to these schools. I worked for the federal government. And the other thing is, the federal government gave money to the survivors. And it was just a token, but it was something. The biggest thing from that was the, the every school from kindergarten to grade 12 to college to university has to learn about us from our perspective. And that's why Canada, if you look into the Canadian on YouTube, if you look into Canadian legends, stories, um, I mean, it, it, it's just incredible what's happening because we have authors, we have cartoon people, we have cartoons in 100% Cree. The kids watch cartoons saying, I'm going to go to the powwow. Are you going to go to the powwow? And it's all in Cree. It's incredible what's happening in Canada. And I worked for the Muckleshoot tribe in Washington State. I worked there in 2000. I worked for Chief Leshley as well. And I came back to Muckleshoot and I was working with the grandchildren of uh, um, the grandkids of the, the, the people that I taught 20 years ago, the parents and their, their children. So I, I really miss it, but I'm, I, my dream was to move to Nevada, and here I am. I just finished my Master's of Educational Administration, and yeah, Orange Shirt Day, um, it's, a, it's, it's a hard day. My family cries. In Canada, the first year we had the Orange Shirt March, over 70,000 people showed up, and these were teachers, these were policemen, these were children um, of all races that showed up to the march. This is pre-pandemic. So I wanted to share that with you, and for in, the, in my language, that's thank you, Palamia, for listening. Thank you. And I think Mercedes would yeah. have one more thing to share. Thank you, Mercedes. Yes, I'm so sorry. It really threw me off when I lost my internet there. <laughs> but I did make a slide. If you could please go to slide 35 and show that. I really want to share that with you. Uh, if you're not able to pull it up, I can just read what's on it. But I do want to share these because uh, there are some important side notes. And I'm scrolling so I can see the the screen. Okay, perfect. So please, 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 very important. Do your own research on the extent of the abuse if you are curious about it. Please do not put the burden on others to share their pain because this is re-traumatizing. Um, I know I've had my experiences and, and I realize now that it's my trauma, either oversharing or there's just this dead, even though the words, I can feel them, they physically cannot come out. And it, it feels terrible to, to experience that. So, you know, there are a lot of videos, a lot of research uh, that you can do on your own to, to find out about what exactly happened. The other really important thing, um, we have gone lightly uh, on the details of abuse, but it is terror. 
that was inflicted. I mean, kids were killed, killed by these people who took them and they said they were caring for them. We know, uh, you know, in our own time, we've seen that they go after Nazi war criminals. Uh, I call for us to do the same thing. These people, just because this was, this happened in the past, that doesn't mean that they should get away with doing this. Just like we went after Nazis, the people that killed and put these kids in the cemeteries, there should be something done. We need to go after them. Also, um, very important, try to explain what a Native American person looks like without sounding like a racist. My point to that is watch your words. Um, there's no one way that Native American people look. We have, uh, you know, we are mixed and we are still members of our tribal nation. Uh, Black Indigenous people, Asian Indigenous people, uh, Hispanic Indigenous people. So our tribes decide our citizenship and no one else does. So really watch your words because I've had this happen in schools. I've had this happen from other Native people, this aggression. So also along with that same line of thought, don't ask people how much Native American are you. We don't ask how much American are you to people. We don't say how black are you if, you know, people look mixed. How Latinx, how Asian are you? We are not Native because of a DNA test. It doesn't work that way. Our identity is not from a blood test. So don't ask how much Native American we are. And again, doing your personal part to right wrongs by defending tribal sovereignty. You know, making sure that your leadership knows that you support upholding ICWA, doing everything you can um, and uplifting visibility uh, in your spaces. So thank you so much. That was really important to me to add that. I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt this moment, um, but thank you for letting me share. Well, thank you. And I know we've run long, but uh, Sandra Cosgrove, are you still on? I know you had something and then we'll, we'll if we haven't answered your question from the chat, we'll, we'll promise to, to get the question answered for you and, and get that answer. So, Sandra. Uh, thank you. So I know probably most of us on here have been paying attention to what's been going on at the school board meetings. I mean, it's like Alabama 1955 again when you go into those meetings. Um, but I, when I get students over at CSM, the community college that come out of CCSD and just teaching, you know, American history, and I definitely make sure we integrate as much indigenous history as possible. My non-indigenous students feel very angry when we get to things that they don't know about. They feel, they, they feel like they've been lied to. They feel like there's things that have, have happened that they should know about, and they don't know why people didn't tell them about these things. And so I think it's important when we're talking about curriculum and the fights that are kind of going on among the adults that our students want to know the truth. Even if it makes America look bad, even if it's awful, horrible, they want to know the truth. And if you, if you say, well, if that was a horrible thing, we, you know, we want to protect them, they're going to be angry later because they're angry in my classes because they want to know. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. So um, we thought we would, um, Juliana would close us out with a song. And if you would like to stay on um, after uh, some of us, we're going to talk about the, the Women's March and planning. So I just want to let you know, even though we're running late, some of us may stay on. So Juliana, could you close us out? Super honored to listen to you guys. You guys are all very powerful, amazing women. And thank you, uh, Pilamaya, for letting me be a part of the meeting. Um, so yeah, I want to close out with a, another Lakota song um, that I composed for all the missing Indigenous women. Um, yeah, okay. Lila Ushika wana wa chaki ya 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 wana wa chaki ya ya. They tried to write our history. Not knowing we were still alive, erase us from their guilty minds. The river flows between us, but we are still all the same. Lila Ushika, Wanawa Chakiya, 
Thank you guys. Thank you. That was beautiful. And thank you for everybody for staying on with us a little longer tonight. It was just a very important um, conversation that we, we needed to have. So thank you to our speakers. And um, if you want to unmute and um, if you're heading out to say goodbye or if you're staying on, we'll be talking about the program after.